Welcome everyone uh, back again to the study of the Masaroth, the, the keys to the Masaroth specifically. And this week we're going to be looking at the sign of Matsneum, the balances, uh, otherwise known as Libra, uh, which is going to cover the exodus out of Egypt and the giving of the law of Mount Sinai. Last time we talked about Virgo, Bethula, and we saw how this was a sign principally concerning separation. The, the term virgin in Hebrew implies to be separate. And we saw how Abraham and Sarah were called to, to get out of their country and, and from their kinsmen. And they were to separate themselves. And this was a theme throughout the, the lives of the early patriarchs, this, this constant separating that was taking place. Uh, Jacob and Esau, there were two manner of uh, people in, in her, her womb uh, that would be separated one from the other. And when the children of Israel went down into Egypt, uh, they were separated again from the Egyptians. They were in the best of the land in Goshen. And um, and they grew into this multitude. And that's what uh, Yahuwah had told Moses, that uh, his seed would grow into a great multitude. And, and that's the sign of Virgo. Now, uh, we're going to come to our next sign in Libra, Mazneum, and this is a sign dealing with justice and a sign dealing with the law and the giving of the law and the deliverance of the, of the, of the Hebrew slaves out of bondage in Egypt. And we're going to see this in a lot of the symbolism and the minor constellations of this sign, things that people have not noticed before because we've only, the, the only basically interpretations that we've seen up to this point, uh, with the exception of Tim Warner in his book, Mystery of the Masroff, has been the the gospel in, in the stars, if you will, the, the the scales having to do with um Christ being weighed in the balance of, you know, for 30 you know, betrayed, you know, with 30 pieces of silver. Um, and this is like the station of propitiation and the price that covers and, and these kind of things. Uh, but I'm going to show you, I'm going to open up some doors for you that have never been opened before, as far as I know. And um, you can judge for yourself if you think these things have merit. Um, I'm just going to put it out there and then you can see if if uh, there's something here. I think there is. And I want to share what I've discovered over these past 12 years on, on each of these signs. So let's get an overall view um, of the constellation. So here we have the scales. Now, last week we had, or last uh, in the last presentation, we dealt with uh, the Virgin Woman here. And I wanted to point out something. Now, most everyone would interpret this sign, uh, dealing with the Virgin again, as laying prostrate on the ecliptic, ready to give birth to a child. I would suggest uh, an alternative view, or maybe an additional way to look at this as, no, she's not with child. The child has already been birthed. Uh, you, you see the child right here, the mother and child. Um, but the virgin is oriented this way on the ecliptic so that she, the, the scales are under her feet. And what we're going to learn is that these scales represent the law. And she is walking in the paths of, of the law. She's walking in, in, in obedience to the commandments of Yah. And, and that's why she's oriented the way she is. Um, so these are the scales. Now, minor constellations of, of the balances are the uh, corona, uh, borealis, the northern crown. Uh, down over here to the bottom right, you have uh, crux, referred to as the southern cross. But I'm going to show you uh, how this might be something else other than a cross. And we also talked about how this centaur um, is a Greek perversion. Before the 5th century uh, B.C., uh, before the, the time of, of Pindar, the Greek poet, this was the form of a perfect human being. It wasn't uh, half man and half animal, this mixing that we were talking about earlier, which is an abomination. Uh, no, this, this was a shepherd. And a shepherd uh, defends his sheepfold from the wolves. This is a wolf. Um, but again, when you read some of these other books dealing with the Masroth, they have this uh, lupus as the victim. And they have this victim as being Christ. And they have the centaur being the Messiah as well. And, and, and they force the issue and give him uh, this dual nature because it's half man and half animal. So there's this dual nature. And so it represents uh, how Yeshua was both divine and human. And, uh, 
And he says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly, willingly of myself. And so they have both the, the lupus and the centaurus as representing Christ. But I don't see it that way at all. Again, this is a perversion. This was not a centaur. Uh, this was a, a human being. And this is a wolf. Um, to, to associate Ye Ye Yehusha with a wolf, um, I'm not comfortable doing that <laughs> at all. Uh, the wolves come in to steal, kill, and destroy the sheep, the sheepfold, right? So I'm not going there. Um, so that's one of the minor constellations of Libra is this wolf. And the other one is the northern crown. And then the last one is this, uh, this cross, the southern cross here. Um, okay, let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so now we're going to look at the Hebrew elements uh, dealing with Masneum. Um, over here to the bottom left, uh, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. You should serve Yah on this mountain, right? Exodus 39 through 12. So when he does this, he's saying, this is a sign. The sign is when you bring my people out of Egypt and you bring them to worship me on this mountain, that's the sign. And that's what the sign of Libra is about. It's the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt and, and being born on eagle's wings, you know, to the father, to the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai, to the holy mountain of Yah. That, that's the sign. Um, okay, now, so let's look at the meaning of the word masneum in Hebrew for this sign. Uh, balances, and it means to weigh, to test, to prove, yoke, and to hear. These are the principal meanings of the word masneum or the balances. It's not just the weighing. It's not just uh, purchase or redemption, uh, that sort of thing. The, this is the deeper meaning of, of the scales in with the Hebrew name of Maznaim, to weigh, to test, to prove, yoke and hear. And you're going to see how these words are strongly associated with the law, which is what the scales represent. The Hebrew month is Athneum. This was before they went into Babylonian captivity. Now it's known as Tishri, but before that it was Athneum, and, uh, which means permanent brooks, enduring and hard. The Hebrew tribe up here associated with this sign I have as Asher. Now, some have Asher associated with the Virgin. Um, as I brought out in my last presentation, uh, this was known as the House of Bread, um, oftentimes, which, mean, which equates to um, Bethlehem. So even astrologically, you have the Savior being born in Bethlehem. However, I'm going to show you how Asher more fully uh, corresponds to what's going on in the sign of Libra. Again, in the definition of these Hebrew tribes, you're going to find how they correlate with what's going on in Israel's history in the sign that I'm associating them with. Okay, um, and then lastly, and most importantly, I think, is the Hebrew letter that this sign is represented by, the letter He. And, and it conveys the meaning of spirit, breath, life, to behold. Here you have the, this is the block script, has a value of five. And then you have the paleo with a man uh, with his hands raised up, uh, which conveys the idea of to behold something, to get someone's attention. Something important is, is, is uh, being conveyed, is being revealed. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you have the, the glyph down here. Okay, uh, let's take a brief look at references to the scales in the rest of uh, the scripture. Now, the first reference of the balances is in the giving of the law. Uh, just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hen shall you have, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, shall you observe all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. I am Yahuwah. Okay, so right here, this is the first, this is utilizing the law of first mention once again, once again, which I often do to get the principal meaning of a word. I, I go to the first reference where it's used. And here the balances are first mentioned in the giving of the law. Um, Job cried out, oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity laid in the balances together. So balances um, relate to grief um, and calamity. 
uh, in the book of Daniel, moments before the fall of Babylon, a mysterious hand is seen writing on the palace walls of King Belshazzar. And Daniel interprets the mysterious, uh, the mysterious writing and tells the king, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. To be weighed in the balances and found wanting in the day of final settlement and rewards will be a fearful thing, a terrible mistake which no one can correct. So this, this weighing, this, this conveys the idea of judgment. And so this is another correlation of the scales relating to judgment, relating to calamity, relating to grief, relating to that which is just and fair and right. Um, again, in Jeremiah 32, we have, and I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money and the balances. So the balances have to do with wages. Um, you're going to see how that playing out in this story also. Uh, and then lastly, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. So whenever I do any kind of word studies, um, I'm looking up every single word to to get at the meaning of, of these symbols that I find in the book of Revelation and that I find in the Masroth. My, my method of study is, is the same. I look up where these words are used elsewhere. I look up the meaning of those words. I look at the gematria of those words. And that's how I get most of my interpretations, that method right there. Okay, our next slide. Okay, so now, um, to the bottom left here, it says the scales are an ancient symbol associated with law and justice, signifying the impartial deliberation or weighing of two sides in a legal dispute. In ancient times, the scale was used by putting the objects to be weighed on one side and stones and units of measurement on the other. So again, the scales are associated with law and justice. And here we have uh, an image that I found on Google, again, associating the law, the, the first five books of the Bible, with the scales, the symbol of the law. Um, and then, of course, you have Lady Justice. And here you have a woman holding, and, and next to her, or and she's holding some scales. Just like we have in the Zodiac, you have a woman, and then underneath her you have these scales. So there's this association between the woman and these scales. Um, it was to the Virgin of Israel who received the law. It is her foundation upon which she stands. And so that's how I'm looking at this, uh, the way these constellations are uh, situated to one another. Um, she is standing upon the foundation of the holy law of Yahuwah. Um, Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Again, you see the significance of her walking just above uh, the scales there, walking in the path of thy commandments. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to walk in his ways, uh, walking in all the commandments and ordinances, and being blameless. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. And uh, this is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. So that's the... That's the significance of the virgin woman. We know the virgin daughter of Zion, the virgin of Israel. Um, this represents Yah's people walking in obedience to the commandments of Yah. That is how I see it. Okay, uh, so now we come to the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt. So now here again, I briefly elaborated how this was uh, formerly the form of a perfect human being not a mixture, quote unquote, um, delivering um, his sheep from the wolves. And Exodus 3, 9 through 12, it says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to Elohim, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. 
when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve Elohim on this mountain. So now you'll now most of my scriptural references are going to be from King James and New King James. Um, but I like to use the Hebrew names uh, for God and Jesus and those sort of things, which I don't believe are the correct names. Um, and so you'll see me substitute uh, these uh, names for the proper Hebrew names. Um, okay, next slide. So now here, um, it says here Scorpio blended with Libra. So it says here this constellation was blended by the Greeks with Scorpio, forming the outstretched claws of that monster. It seems to have been separated from Scorpio under the name of Libra in the time of Julius Caesar. However, the figure of the scales or balances as an independent constellation is found in all the eastern and most ancient zodiacs. Uh, that's from Raymond Capp's book, The Glory of the Stars, uh, one of the first books that I read. Um, and so at, at one point, um, now see these two stars. There's one here on the lower scale, and there's another one up here. Um, I'm going to give you their meaning. Well, the meaning that we've been given in so many of the books that if any of you have studied this subject in any amount of detail at all, even read one book, I'm sure you've come across the meaning of these two star names. And I'm going to lay them out for you. Uh, first of all, in the Arabic, and then and then what Bollinger and Cap and others, uh, how they interpret it. So Arabian astronomers following Ptolemy knew these stars as al Zubana. And so this is all the claws. It's as if Scorpio is overlaying the scales, and so you only see the scorpion. And so this star here is, uh, well, let's start with this one, the northern one. So down here, I'm sorry, uh, look at the star names. Um, Zubin el Shamali. Now that's this star in the upper scale here. The Arabic is meaning of that star name, the Arabic star name is the Northern Claw. That is the actual definition meaning of that star name. However, in Bollinger's book, in Cap's book, and all the other books who, who continue to copy from these people, they're using a, a different definition. It's, it's not a definition of that, of that word at all. If you go to any Arabic uh, source for defining these star names, it's always going to be the Northern Claw. That's why you have the picture of the claws. These star names tell you how to draw these figures. And so that star name represents a claw. But as I brought out in my introduction uh, to this series, it was Francis Rolleston in the late 1800s who took these Arabic uh, star name um, words, it took the, the root of these words, the Arabic star names, um, and related them to similar sounding Hebrew root words. And then she took those Hebrew root words to come up with these meanings. And so, but these are not the actual meaning uh, of these star names at all. That's that's completely uh, made up by picking and choosing and, and, and trying to match the sound of one uh, Arabic word with, with a similar sounding Hebrew word or Hebrew re, uh, root word. Um, there's a couple of problems with that, which I went into before. One, some of these Arabic star names are more modern than ancient. And two, before the 11th century, we didn't have the, the vowel points uh, in, in the Hebrew alphabet. And so we can't say for certain necessarily how some of these words were pronounced. So to try to match them phonetically, uh, you know, is a problem. And so I, I do not use these names anymore. I do not use the definitions that Bollinger and these others use. I go with the actual meaning, the actual Arabic meaning of these star names. That's what I go by. Um, but here you can see this is Zodiac in Dendera, Egypt. Um, this dates back to about the, the um, about 5,000 years. And here you see they have the scales. And so the scales have always been there, but there's been times where the scales disappeared and it was just a scorpion. It was just one sign here instead of two. Uh, but again, when you get into the Greek uh, time period, there's a lot of Hellenization going on and a lot of mixing going on. And then you start to lose some of these things. But, but here we have this Dendera Zodiac that predates the Greeks and they have the scales there right next to the scorpion. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to point out, um, uh, Bollinger and Cap 
Um, see, in Arabic, al zubana meaning purchase or redemption. See that you'll, I'm sure you've heard those terms before if you've studied the Masroth. That's how Libra is referred to, meaning purchase or redemption. And then they go into scriptural references that relate to, to that. But that is not the actual meaning. It means the clause, not this. Okay. All right. So the Greeks called Libra Zugos, the yoke. It says, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their bondman. And I have broken the bands of your yoke. And so now we're tying this, this sign of the scales, this yoke, into the, to the bondage of Egypt. I mean, to the bondage of the children of Israel in Egypt. And how that bondage is going to be broken. I have broken the bands of your yoke. Now, come with me over to the left side of my slide here and to the bottom picture, and you see Aries. And Aries is the Passover ram, and, uh, lamb. And it has its forelegs stretched out across the bands of Pisces, the two fish. Now, these two signs, Libra and Aries, they are related. They are opposing signs directly across one another on the zodiac uh, belt. And so these signs relate to one another. Um, in Ezekiel, now down here you have this uh, sea monster. See this, the sea monster is half animal and half fish. Now, now sometimes when you have this amalgamation of man and beast, or in this case, it's beast and a fish, sometimes um, that's okay. Sometimes that may be its actual intent because you have these type of figures in the book of Revelation. Uh, you have a beast that has seven heads, you know, and and it's coming out of the sea, and, and you have some other um, figures there that um, have this mixture going on. So sometimes it's it's that way on purpose, and you have to get at the symbolism of it um, using the scripture. And so here in Ezekiel 32, 2, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, you are like a young lion among the nations, and you are like a monster in the seas bursting forth in your rivers, troubling the waters with your feet and fouling the rivers. Here you see this beast, this monster in the sea, Cetus, with his feet troubling the waters. This river here is the Nile River. Um, and that's, that's another sign in, in Taurus that we'll get to eventually. But what I will show you when we get there is how the, the form of this constellation, the way it moves across the sky, the way it's outlined, parallels that of the Nile River. You just put them side by side and it's identical. And so this represents Pharaoh and he's got the bands attached to his neck that are attached to the fish. But the ram comes, the Passover ram, the 10th plague, the blood of the lamb is what sets the captives free that were being oppressed by the Egyptians. Um, so uh, this second verse here, now over to the right. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that's a New Testament reference referring to our Savior, but this also applies to the children of Israel when they were delivered by Moses, delivered by the Most High God, uh, Yahuwah, and he said, come unto me. Come on to Mount Sinai, come out of bondage, come unto me, and my yoke will be easy, and my burden will be light, and my laws will be just and fair and right. Um, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So this yoke that the Greeks called Libra is a yoke of bondage, and that directly corresponds to the children of Israel in this next segment of their history as being signified in the Masroth signs, in Libra, this is the time period when they are in bondage in Egypt. And it's the Passover ram, the Lamb of God, that sets them free. The tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, those that had the blood above their doors, they were spared. And the next day they were set free from bondage. Um, again, in, in this sign of um, Pisces that has the bands that are in bondage with by Pharaoh, one of the modern constellations over to the right here is Andromeda. And here is his woman, 
So the virgin woman again, but she is in chains. She's in bondage, but she is going to, and you see the association between this woman and the fish. They're one and the same. Um, Elohim sets the solitary in families. He brings out those which are bound with chains. So there's this bondage being broken, these chains being broken. The Hebrew name for a Libra is Maznaim, meaning scale, and its primitive root is Azan, which means to weigh, to prove, or test. And, of course, when we come to uh, the giving of the law in Exodus 20, it says, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightning, the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear but let not Elohim speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for Elohim is come to, what? Prove you, that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. That is the meaning of these scales. It means to weigh, to test, to prove. He is coming to prove them. And it's in regards to his law. Then said uh, the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and that people should go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So here is a very direct connection between the, the literal meaning of the word maznaim, the scales, this primitive root, meaning to weigh, to prove, to test. You see it right here in the giving of the law and how his people are being proved or being tested, whether they will walk in his law or no. Now, let's look at this Hebrew letter. The, the letter He has a value of five. And um, you, you'll notice, now, when they were told to put the blood above their door, it's kind of just like the letter He, isn't it? It looks like the letter He. And in most languages, when you want to express yourself to get someone's attention, you say, hey. The Hebrew letter He conveys the same idea. It means to look, to behold, to reveal. The original pictograph was of a man standing with his hands raised above his head to draw attention to something of great significance or importance. And here you have it right here. Two of the four letters in the Tetragrammaton is the letter He. yud He vav He. This should alert us to the importance of this letter a letter of expression and revelation when the creator revealed himself to his people upon Mount Sinai. Open thou mine eyes that I may what? Behold wondrous things out of thy law. That's the letter He. Its principal meaning is to behold. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel. Right? It's come unto me and I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore and I will send you unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the Elohim of Israel. Right, And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, as it were, body of heaven in its clearness. And here it says, uh, now this is, I'm emphasizing the word they saw. The, the word hey conveys this idea to look, to behold, to reveal, to see something important. They saw the Elohim of Israel. They beheld his glory. Um, behold, uh, um, Yahuwah, our Elohim, has showed us his glory and his greatness. Okay, continuing on with this letter. Hey has a value of five. This holy number is full of biblical significance. It is generally understood as representing balance. We have five toes on both sides of our feet, as well as five fingers on each hand. The balance between law and grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Yeshua HaMashiach. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And that's in Romans 5. So the most well-known chapter on grace and this balance of law and grace is in Romans 5, and that is the commentary of this letter, 5. Um, but Elohim led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Now, you could just read that verse and go right past this and not see anything significant until you look at some other translations 
And it says the word harnessed or a kamosh in Hebrew is defined in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. And I'm sure you would find this in any lexicon as well as arrayed for battle by fives or in ranks or divisions of fives. Uh, but Elohim led the people around by the way of the wilderness, by the sea of Suf, and the people of Israel went up in five divisions out of the land of Egypt. That is our Hebrew letter for this sign. It's the number five. It has the value of five. And this five is connected with the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt, being brought to Mount Sinai to receive the law contained in five books. And there you have it. <laughs> and of course, for barely I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And even that is mentioned in Matthew 5. It's like <laughs> these connections, they just keep coming and coming and coming. Um, in the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness, which Elohim gave Moses the instructions for building in Mount Sinai, Nearly every measurement is a multiple of five. Now, I realize, of course, this is a drawing that I did a few years ago, and I realize there's a possibility that this may have been circular and, and not as I have it here. Um, however, these are the dimensions that are given, and they are all multiples of five. The courtyard is specified as being 100 by 50 cubits. There were 60 pillars, which is five times 12, held up uh, the curtain around the courtyard, and they were spaced five cubits apart and five cubits high. The building itself was, according to the dimensions, 10 by 10 by 30 cubits, multiples of five. It was made up of 48 vertical boards held together by five bars passing through the golden rings attached to the boards. And the dimensions of the veil of the courtyard was 20 times five cubits and hung upon five pillars. Now, another thing I like to do is go to Psalms 119, because as most of you know, um, this psalm, different than the other psalms, is divided into stanzas of eight verses each. And each of these stanzas is headed by one of the 22 Hebrew letters. And so I go to each of the 12 letters that the Masoroth uh, zodiac signs is represented by, and, and I, I see what kind of additional meaning I can get from these letters, because these letters are what heads these, these verses. These verses are going to relate to the meaning of that letter. And so the very first thing you read, the first verse in this stanza, headed by the letter He, is, Teach me, O Yahuwah, the way of your statutes. Um, I shall keep your law. I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies. Behold, I long for your precepts. So this stanza headed by the letter H is all about the commandments, right? It's the direct connection again, tying this letter to the scales, to the law, and, and, and you see all these verses directly related to that. Uh, now, something else about uh, this, uh, the law was written on blue sapphire stones. That's my belief, and, and this is the evidence for it. And they saw the Elohim of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give you tables of stone, and a law, and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And he, and this was just, uh, these, that's verse 10 and verse 12. So he's standing upon sapphire stone, and then he gives Moses two stones that he cut out of the ground that he was standing on. Uh, blue, now, blue sapphire stone, I found this very interesting, is considered a stone of wisdom and prophecy and royalty. Sapphires are supposed to bring protection, insight, and good fortune. Well, that you could, I could have, you know, I see that in, in, in right here in, in, in the book of Numbers. It, it tells you that. Uh, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, 
and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Yahuwah and to do them. And, and they were said to be, you know, this is your wisdom in the sight of the nations, right? And this, this you will prosper uh, by keeping these commandments. You will have good fortune. You will have good insight. You will have protection, right? And so it's interesting that the world recognizes the uh, spiritual significance, if you will, uh, of the sapphire stone, the blue sapphire stone, which I believe the commandments were written on, and they give you all those things, <laughs> right? They make you a child of the king, uh, royalty. And of course, one of the minor constellations in this sign is Corona, the royal crown. Um, and then I also found it interesting that Israel has their flag. Now, I saw someone in the chat here, and they had... And I was just thinking about that this morning. Like, this shouldn't be this six-pointed hexagram star. It should be the menorah. They were to be the light of the world. Um, but it says, And Yahuwah shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if you shall keep the commandments of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to walk in his ways. And so they were to be a holy people. Holiness, that's the white. So even in the Israeli flag today, they got the colors right. They were to be a holy nation symbolized by the white, and they were to keep his commandments symbolized by the blue. And, and uh, they were to put a ribbon of blue on the hem of their garments that they may look upon it and remember all the commandments. Now, let's take a look at this constellation. Now, this, this is going to be interesting. So this is the Southern Cross. That's what it's known as. And that's kind of what it looks like. I agree. Uh, despite being the smallest constellation in the night sky, Crux is one of the brightest and most recognizable constellations. It contains two first magnitude stars and as such has proved a very useful tool for navigating sailors as a timepiece. Now, I found it interesting that at midnight, now, this can only be seen in the southern um, the southern lands uh, beyond the equator. And you'll notice that these nations down there have, uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, but here it says, at midnight, the cross stands perpendicular. Before and after, it leans to the left or right. Midnight is the darkest hour of the night. It was at midnight that Elohim chose to deliver his people from Pharaoh in Egypt. Very interesting. And it came to pass that at midnight, Yahuwah smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Um, the coming of the bridegroom in the New Testament is at midnight. The second coming of Christ will take place at the darkest hour of this earth's history. Uh, and this constellation here is located in the darkest area of the heavens. You see some dark blotches here in, in the surrounding area around Crux. Um, when, Ye uh, when Yahusha was on the cross, there was darkness, as you recall, over all the land. And then I found this also interesting, that the Southern Cross was last seen in the night sky over Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. Since that time, it has not been seen in the northern latitudes. Many observers linked its disappearance with the crucifixion of Christ. Very interesting. Now, let's go deeper. Let's go a lot deeper. Because that's about as far as you're going to go in any of these other books that you're going to read on the Masroth. I'm going to take you through some other doors that have not been opened before. And it was somebody in this group that uh, pointed me in this direction that they thought perhaps this uh, Southern Cross is the letter Tav. And so I did some study on that, some additional study and research and thinking and meditating. And this is what I have discovered. Now, Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet, meaning mark, sign, omen, or seal. It is the symbol of truth, perfection, and completion. Well, you can certainly identify that with, uh, the, with the Torah. Uh, then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. Okay, it just so happens that the letter Tav has a value of 
400. So there's a connection right there. Therefore, shall you lay up these words, my words, in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign. So this is the meaning of this letter. It means a sign or a mark. And here the children of Israel are being told to bind them as a sign upon your hand that you may be as that they may be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall teach them your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. For you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them. And so here again, you see this very strong association with the letter Tav and its meaning and the commandments. This is a sign. This is a mark that's placed upon his people. And Yahuwah said unto him, go through the midst of the city. This is in Ezekiel. Through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the forehead. Set a Tav upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And then again in Revelation 7, I saw another angel standing from the east having the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and to see, saying, don't hurt the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim in their foreheads. Again, this takes you back to the meaning that the letter Tav is conveying a seal, a sign, a mark. These are all synonymous terms with one another. And then um, if this is to be taken as a cross and or both, um, then um, you could go this direction with, with the cross representing self-denial. And of course, um, our Savior said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Um, so you can factor that in or not factor that in. Um, I think the greater significance is the Tav. I think that's what this is. And here's something that's even more interesting. Again, this is brand new material. I've never shared this with anyone before. You are the first ones to hear this. Um, now, this is the open star cluster in Crux. And it's nicknamed, appropriately, the Jewel Box. So within the Tav is this, these jewels. So uh, this group of young bright stars was named the Jewel Box from its description by Sir John Herschel as a casket of variously colored precious stones, which refers to its appearance in the telescope. Well, now look what it says in the scriptures concerning the children of Israel in Egypt. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, the earth, the gematria of the letter Tav, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And then fast forward to Exodus 12, And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we be all dead men. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And Yahuwah gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. So before leaving Egypt, the people, by the direction of Moses, they were, they were claiming a recompense for their unpaid labor. And the Egyptians were all too eager to be freed from their presence to refuse them. Thus, after 400 years, justice, you might say, was served. The Hebrew slaves at long last received their appropriate wages, the balances, the scales, for their long years of servitude and hard labor. Beautiful. Now, Here's something that's very interesting. Um, now, located between the Tav and between uh, the wolf here is what's been nicknamed the Hand of God, they call it, uh, Nebula Pulsar B1509. Now, it says the Hand of God, now we would say Elohim, uh, Nebula is located between Lupus, the wolf, and Centaurus, the shepherd, originally in the modern constellation of uh, Circanus. Uh, the compass. So, so this is actually located in another 
constellation that's been recently made up called Circinus, the compass. Um, but it's positioned between these two, or, or, or also between um, the shepherd and the wolves. And, and you have this hand here that's being stretched out, it's an outstretched hand. Um, uh, this stellar cor corpse is estimated to be close to 2,000 years old. Now, I don't know if that's correct or not. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but that is an interesting uh, time frame there. Uh, if you're going to relate it to the cross, dating it back to the time of the crucifixion. Um, and so if that's the case, you might see this as a memorial of Christ's death upon the cross in the heavens. And, and there's a verse you could use here, Habakkuk 3, 3 and 4. Um, Elohim came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Silat. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns, which if you look that word up, means a ray of light, a ray of light coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Um, I, I think that this is... Um, if this is an artistry, if this is actually there, now it has a designation here, a B1509. So if you have a good telescope, um, you can program that number in and it will take you right to that image in the heavens. So it's there, right? I just don't know how much has been doctored up or if it has, or this is just all, you know, long exposure and this is what you have. Um, I'm just opening up some doors. I'm just showing you things that people have not looked at before and consider it as possibly something that may be significant in this story. Um, but it looks like a hand that's being stretched out. Um, others, others would also see perhaps a crown and thorns and a couple of eyes behind the hand. And uh, maybe that's maybe that might be there. I don't know. Uh, but it's definitely a hand that's stretched out. You can see the fingers, well, at least four of the five. And that's what... Uh, Yehuda did when he stretched out his hand and delivered his people. Remember the constellation Aries has his foreleg stretched out across the band to recover his lost sheep. Okay, moving on. Uh, now to the constellation Corona Borealis, the northern crown. Um, here are a couple of the star names. Alfika, which means the bright one of the broken ring. And here you have the actual constellation of stars. Very beautiful. Um, I've never seen that, uh, but that's going to be in the southern lands uh, beyond beneath the equator. So uh, if you're in the northern hemisphere, in the northern latitudes, um, you're not going to be able to see this. Um, and then the other star, Gemma, um, means jewel. So here you have this jewel, a jeweled crown. Um, in Hebrew, th this crown mean, is the word nazar or nezer, uh, something that's set apart. Well, Bethulah was set apart. His people were set apart. They were dedicated. Um, uh, dedication of a priest or a Nazarite crown as a sign of consecration, a chaplet, especially of royalty. Um, it says here, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and I brought you unto myself. He's separating and consecrating his people, his bride unto himself to be his royal bride. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, right? Who has called you out of darkness. Um, other crowns that are mentioned in the Bible. Uh, well, first of all, his people are a, or to be, a virtuous woman. Uh, it says, is a crown to her husband. And so this crown symbolizes the children of Israel, his people, they were espoused at Mount Sinai is when they were espoused to Yahuwah to be his bride. Um, thou shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of Yahuwah and a royal diadem. So this crown is also signifying all of this. Uh, there's also mention of, of a crown of righteousness. Righteousness is right doing. It's keeping his commandments. All his commandments are righteousness. Uh, and then, of course, if you are faithful unto death, right, I will give you a crown of life. Now let's look a little bit further at this northern crown. So the kings of Israel were coronated in the seventh month, corresponding to Libra. The first, the first king of Israel was Yahuwah, who showed himself mighty in battle in delivering his people out of the hands of Pharaoh. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? 
Yahuwah strong and mighty, Yahuwah mighty in battle, right? He is that king. He is their king. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am Yahuwah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. There's that outstretched arm. And over here again, you see Aries with his arm or his, his, uh, stretched out. And with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people as a bride, and I will be to you an Elohim, right? I will be your husband. Okay, now the last minor constellation of, of Libra is Lupus, the wolf. Now here, you can see this association of the Egyptians with the wolf. Now this is Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of cemeteries, embalming, and the afterlife. And uh, in here, you have even the wolf, Anubis, with the pair of balances. Wolf, balances. Wolf, balances. We're dealing with Egypt here. Lupus the wolf is positioned under the scales of Libra while being pierced through by Centaurus in Virgo. In front of its open mouth is the tail end of Hydra, the sea serpent, in Leo. So here's the wolf, and out of his mouth is the tail end of the serpent. All right, now it says in Isaiah 9.15, the ancient and the honorable, he is the head, and the prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. This tail represents lies that are coming out of the mouth of the wolves, and the wolves in the Bible are the false prophets. Uh, wolves down here, wolves ravening the prey, wolves in sheep's clothing, who made the commandments of Elohim, sim symbolized by Libra, of none effect by their traditions. Right? Um... Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out here. Now, this first verse here, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. Now, the Egyptians were, were known as... Uh, in, one, in one of the parables, chapter 89 of the book of Enoch, uh, I don't necessarily um, um, agree with the book of Enoch on many accounts, but I do find it interesting uh, that in one of the chapters dealing with parables, uh, the Egyptians are likened to wolves who were oppressing the sheep. And the sheep, of course, are the children of Israel. And in this sign here, and again, this is not a centaur, this is the man, this is the shepherd. Moses was a shepherd for 40 years before he was sent to recover uh, the children of Israel, and then he was their shepherd for another 40 years, right? He was delivering his people from the Egyptians, from the wolves, and he even slew a man. So this right here could be a representation, may very well be a representation of Moses uh, slaying an Egyptian, right? Um, it's not Yahusha killing himself, as, as I've heard Many other authors talk about, oh, this is, you know, Yeshua, he's the victim, and no one takes his life. You know, he took his own life, so he basically killed himself, committed suicide. No, 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 no. No, no, no. <laughs> That's not what it was. Um, and over here, now this is one of the modern constellations in Virgo. Um, this is where I believe Moses was brought before Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, and she even has the headdress of, of a daughter of Pharaoh there. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she called his name Moses, and she said, because I came out of the water. So this, there's so much that we have not heard about the story of the Masroth as it relates to the children of Israel. And um, it's just amazing, but also wonderful that this, this knowledge is now being revealed, um, not to me, but I'm sure to some others as well. We're all in this together to, to recover these jewels that have been scattered and, and, and now they're coming together and we're seeing really beautiful things and beautiful stories that are illustrated in all of this symbolism of the Maserat. Okay, a lot of text, but I'm not going to read all of it. Um, but <clears throat> I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, positioned directly in front of the mouth of Lupus is the tail of Hydra. The tail is representative of prophets who teach lies. And I mentioned that scripture already, so I won't repeat that. Um, and this is referring to the children of Israel, how it says, for we have made lies our refuge, specifically the people which are in Jerusalem. We have made lies our refuge. 
uh, woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies. And so these wolves, those who were leading Israel, their priests and their prophets and, and whatnot, they were all full of lies. And so they can rightly be represented as wolves. And this, these are the people that our Savior had to deal with because he was the good shepherd. He was a great shepherd. He came to deliver his people out of the mouths of the wolves. Um um, and it was prophesied. I'll just read, uh, let's just read the bottom one. Um, you can screen capture this if you want to. Uh, thus says Yahuwah Elohim, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be meat for them. For thus says Yahuwah Elohim, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and I will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered. So that's the story going on here. Not only Moses delivering his people, Moses was a messianic figure. So this can apply both to Moses and the story of the children of Israel, but it can also be applied to our Savior, the Good Shepherd, delivering his people at that time out of the mouths of, of the hungry wolves who were perverting his law. Um, and now let's just for a brief moment, let's just look a little bit more at the foreshadowing of Christ in the scales. It was prophesied of Yahushua. Uh, Yahuwah is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. And he did that in Matthew 5. That's our Hebrew letter. Hey, value 5. Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill that law. Right. And then, of course, he was weighed for 30 pieces of silver. And the Persian spheres show a human figure lifting the scales in one hand and grasping a lamb in the other. This being the usual form of a weight for a balance in the early East. OK, moving on. Um, a little bit more of this foreshadowing. Now, again, this letter, hey, its principal meaning is to behold. And it's one of, you know, two of the four letters of the sacred name of Yahuwah, uh, yud Hey vav Hey. And you take these letters individually, and what you have is behold the nail, behold the hand, right? But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And when Yeshua comes to John the Baptist on the uh, the Jordan uh, River there, he calls him out and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of Elohim that takes away the sin of the world. So here is this behold. He's telling everyone to behold. Uh, uh, he is the personification of the Torah, right? He kept the law perfectly on our behalf. Um, again, during his trial, Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. Behold your king. But they answered, we have no king but Caesar. Right. And so you can see how in the story of, of uh, the crucifixion and the trial, all of that, you see also symbolized um, Yahushua uh, work in accomplishing man's redemption. So it's the story of the children of Israel, but there's a lot of foreshadowing, uh, dual applications here. Uh, and the word of God is like that throughout. There's not just one layer of interpretation. Uh, I'm trying to stick as much as possible just to one layer relating to the history of Israel because I don't want to confuse people too much by going to too many different directions. But here and there, I am going to show you some things uh, that relate uh, to uh, the foreshadowing of the Messiah as well. Okay, now let's look at the corresponding Hebrew tribe. Now, I had mentioned earlier that some have Asher associated with the Virgo. Maybe that's right. Here are the reasons I have Asher associated with the scales. Uh, first of all, it says when he was born, Leah said, I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. So his name means happy and blessed. And uh, in Jacob's prophecy, it says out of Asher, his bread shall be fat and he shall yield royal dainties. Now the children of Israel, they were delivered on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, weren't they? On the 15th day. The 14th day was the Passover lamb. that was slain at midnight, uh, 10th plague. The next day, they were set free. That 
was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you can tie the bread aspect of the tribe of Asher directly to the deliverance of the children of Israel. That is when they were delivered on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day. That's how I understand it. I think that's correct, right? And he shall yield royal dainties. Well, there's your royal crown. Um, and it says, happy are those who keep his commandments, right? Blessed are they that do his commandments. Um, and so you have that connection. Um, Asher is most blessed of the son. Yes, if you keep the commandments, you will be most blessed. Um, again, this letter, uh, I'm sorry, no, this bottom uh, paragraph. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahuwah, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. For Yahuwah shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. And over here to the left, underneath the banner of Asher, you see the meaning of the name Asher. It means to be straight in the widest sense, especially to be level. Well, Libra, you have the scales. Libra corresponds to the, um, the autumnal equinox, when day and night are equal. Uh, it means to be level, to be right, to be happy. Figuratively, to go forward, to be honest, prosper, be blessed, to go straight, walk, advance, make progress. All of this is directly related to the deliverance of the children of Israel and going straight. Straight is the gate, narrows the way, right? Um, to, to be level, to have honest skills and happy, how happy they would be and blessed if they keep his commandments and they would prosper. So all of this uh, meaning of, of Asher ties directly to the story of the children of Israel in this sign. Um, here we have uh, this is the significance of the meaning of Asher's name as it relates to Libra and the law of Moses. Uh, now, I just quoted most of these scriptures, so uh, I'll, I'll pass by some of the ones that I already just mentioned. Uh, down here, it says that uh, you have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. Uh, the aspect of prospering. Uh, he that keepeth the law, happy is he. This is love that we walk after his commandments. Walk in it. Um, blessed are they that do his commandments. So all of this is tied to the meaning of Asher's name. All right. Now, uh, of course, we have many of the, the fall feasts are, are occurring in the sign of Libra. So here we have, uh, now I just have a brief summary. Um, most of these people uh, know, know these uh, feasts very well and what they signify. Um, you can screen capture this if you like. Uh, but the first one, the Feast of Trumpets, the, it's a day of shouting, a day of blasting. It's a memorial of blowing of trumpets. A memorial of what? To this point, what had happened previously to this that had to do with trumpets blowing? that were now going to be memorialized. I believe um, that it was the voice of the trumpet that was exceeding loud. And when all the people trembled in the camp, right? Uh, that's, I believe the Feast of Trumpets signifies the giving of the law. That's when the trumpet sounded loud and the people feared exceedingly. The trumpet was exceedingly loud and they greatly feared and um, in Isaiah 58, 1, it says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression. Well, sin is the transgression of the law. And so that's how I tie this first then to, to the memorial of, of the trumpet when it was sounding at Mount Sinai uh, and revealing the law. Uh, and then you come to the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, uh, to cover, to disannul, forgive, purge, reconcile. Um, this now interesting. Now in Daniel seven ten, it says uh, it talks about this judgment that was set and the books that were opened, and the Jews to this day they see this day as a day of afflicting your soul, a day of cleansing, the cleansing of the sanctuary on this day, cleansing of his people, a day of atonement, a day of judgment, and a day of sealing. In fact, still today they would you know greet one another and pray that they would receive a good seal on this day. So this day relates to sealing. It relates to judgment, to atonement, uh, day of affliction. Um, a lot of this applies to what happened in the story of the children of Israel, right? They had been afflicted all this time. 
And now they're being brought out of Egypt and they're going to be washed up. They're going to be cleaned up right, and atoned for and uh, given good laws. And, and they're going to be sealed, uh, as it were, to be his people. Uh, and then you have another blowing of the trumpet, uh, the year of Jubilee. And I think this one correlates to the second coming, not this one, uh, the Feast of Trumpets. That's the memorial blowing of trumpets when the trumpet sounded long at Mount Sinai. I've done a study um, showing that how all the events that occurred like in Exodus 19 and 20 is a parallel of what happens at the second coming in, in every respect. And so I think what happened on Mount Sinai was a, a foretaste of what's going to happen at the second coming. So I do believe there's that aspect of it. But we are set free, you know, at the second coming of Christ on the day of Jubilee, which is the day of atonement, the same day. That's when everything is returned back, as you know, uh, to the original owner. Everything is made right. All sins forgiven. Everything is, uh, the slate is wiped clean. Um, then, of course, you have the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. Um, and this was uh, after the fruit of the land had been gathered in is when they were to celebrate this. Uh, it was a time of rejoicing with palm branches before Yahuwah, our Elohim. Um, and the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees were used to, uh, they were to make for themselves to build these, these huts, these temporary dwelling places. And, and then they were to rejoice before uh, Yahuwah, their Elohim, for seven days. And I believe this is our, our, our temporary home, as these were temporary dwelling places. To, it commemorated their dwelling in, in the land for 40, not in the land, in the wilderness for 40 days. That was their temporary home. But he wanted to bring them into the promised land. And so I believe this is our, now Now there'll be some that will disagree on this, but I just wanna share my opinion on this and then you can take it or not. Uh, but I believe after Christ returns, we are taken to heaven and that is gonna be our time of Feast of Tabernacles, our temporary home where the fruit of the land has been gathered in, right? And, and then it mentions this fruit of beautiful trees and branches of palm trees, symbol of victory. Um, we'll have access to the tree of life uh, when we get to heaven. Um, and we will most certainly be rejoicing before you who are our Elohim. Um, so that's how I see the feast real briefly. Uh, we don't have time to go really into these things, but these are all part of this sign of Libra, the balances, a, a day of judgment. And now let's look at the corresponding Hebrew month. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Prior to the Babylonian captivity, I'm getting close to, uh, I got four more slides. Uh, prior to their captivity in uh, Babylon, it, this month was known as Ethanim. Uh, the Hebrew word Ethanim refers to the seventh month of the ancient Hebrew calendar before the Babylonian exile. Now, I want to show you, this is a layout of Mount Sinai here. And I'm going to be referring to this as I read these scriptures and these definitions for this, uh, the meaning of this Hebrew month, which I find really significant. So its meaning is the permanent brooks enduring from, a, from an unused root, meaning to continue, permanence, hence concrete, permanent. So embedded in the meaning of this name is this idea of permanence. You had a, there, was a, there was a brook, by the way that descended from Mount Sinai right here, descended down and went on out into the camp. There was a, a brook that descended from the mountain. Um, and the commandments are forever, right? They can't be changed. They are till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until all is fulfilled. So there is this permanent nature of the law that was given. So this month is rightly named, uh, you know, that conveys this meaning. Um, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Um, that righteousness and judgment is coming from the throne of God right here and, and running down as a mighty stream. Uh, the words enduring, continue, permanence, concrete are words that speak of the permanent, concrete, and enduring nature of the law of Elohim. So there you have it. Nothing shall be, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. Now, let's look at some biblical events that occurred in, when the sun was in Libra. So it was on the first day of the seventh month, as the priest read the law of Moses to the children of Israel before the water gate. Uh, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. So it's significant that 
in this month, which signifies the giving of the law to the children of Israel, Libra, this is the month that Ezra chose to read the law to the people. So they read in the book and the law of um, Elohim distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Uh, according to the Jewish tradition, the word was created, the world was created on the first day of the seventh month, the Feast of Trumpets, um, also referred to as Rosh Hashanah, uh, the head of the month or the year, but this is, uh, we know this is the seventh month. Um, Noah's Ark came to rest in the seventh month. Uh, we have the glory of Yahuwah filled the temple uh, in the seventh month. And you have uh, Jacob going up to Bethel to build an altar during the seventh month. And, uh, and then both Deborah and Rebecca's nurse and Rachel died in the seventh month. Um, so I find this really interesting that you have this coronation of the kings of Judah that happened when the sun is in the scales which has that minor constellation of Corona, the crown, right? And this is when they began to follow their king, the king of Israel, Yahuwah, Elohim, right? Uh, you have this crown there. And now let's go, uh, this is, um, I think, second to the last slide. Um, each sign has a corresponding disciple. Now, this is not as concrete as some of the tribes are when I line these up, but this is what I found. So I have Simon, the Canaanite, Simon the Zealot, um, corresponding to the sign of Libra, the balances, the scale, uh, representing the law. Uh, Simon, Shimon, meaning hearing or heard. And uh, also so Canaanite, uh, which means uh, zealous. So it means to hear and to be zealous. And we have this scripture in Deuteronomy 31, 12, gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear El uh, Yahuwah, your Elohim, and observe to do all the words of this law. Uh, does our law judge any man before it hears him? And when they heard it, they glorified Yahuwah and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which are believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So in the meaning of Simon's name and where he is from, all that, that I see all that correlates to the law and that therefore to Libra. Okay, last slide. Uh, promises related to the constellations and the sign of Libra. So here we have, uh, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn thee not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest, right? For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success, right? Uh, when this book of the law will not depart out of your mouth, and you observe to do all these things. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which uh, uh, our Savior has promised to those who love him. Uh, and there, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that will be given to him and to all those who love his appearing. And finally, then they that feared Elohim, uh, Yahuwah, spake uh, often one to another, and Ye Yahuwah hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him. For them that feared Yahuwah, and that thought upon his name, and they shall be mine, saith Yahuwah of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Remember the jewel box that uh, we saw in this sign. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. That is the story conveyed in Libra. That is the deliverance of the children of Israel out of the mouths of the wolves, out of the mouths of the Egyptians who were harassing the sheep. They're brought out to be married unto Yahuwah, to receive his laws, his righteous laws and commandments, just laws, laws that were fair, and to be espoused unto him. Um, that's that sign in our next lesson. Uh, the, the, the sign will be uh, Scorpio, and that's going to relate to the 40 years. This is the next segment in Israel's history 
when they were forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years with scorpions and serpents. 